it's different every time. And in fact, years ago, there was an, uh, I did do something like that uh, for um, a magazine uh, where, a, where a journalist actually followed me around and, and we tried to, but, but um, it's, it's slightly different every time. My inspiration comes from everywhere. Uh, just walking down the street, just, and I never know where it's going to come from. So I keep a notebook with me at all times. Um, and the only criteria for anything making it into that notebook is if it stops me in my tracks for even an instant, if it catches my eye or my ear, you know, and, and I just write it down. That means there, there are recipes in there, <laughs> you know, there are words. And sometimes there's a character description, or sometimes it's a line. And after that point, though, uh, what happens is kind of odd. Um, I tend to, I work in fragments, uh, in, in the sense that I'm not going to sit down and say, first line is this, and now I'm going to just write my way through it. I let the poem, it's like piecing it together like a pot. So I I'll, might I'll, have a line that I might write down on the middle of a page, and I still write things down with a pen on paper. I go to the computer when, when it gets too messy and use it like an elaborate typewriter because I print it out and then I mess it up again. But when I do get down, sit down to write in my room, in my study, and I try to write at a certain time uh, every night. I'm a night person. My best times are midnight to six, actually. Um, I'll leave through my notebooks and if something catches my eye and I feel like I want to transfer it from the notebook to the page, I do. And then comes this very strange process, which is difficult to describe, in that I write until I get stuck, or I can't go any further, or I'm boring myself, or whatever. And then I might go to another poem. Uh, I might go to another folder where there are other drafts of poems in various stages of completion. And the only way I have for keeping track of all this fragmentary stuff is by color. And I have different colored folders, red folders, blue, yellow. So I might go into my study, let's say one evening, and say, I feel like the blue folder today. And I'll pick up the blue folder and see what's in there. So it, it, it's something that I've kind of worked at over the years, but the, the colors are only because I didn't want to put anything, I didn't want to file anything in a, in a straight, um, you know, I think if you put something in a file that says war poems or love poems, that you already restrict the way in which the poem might move. If I put it in blue, it could be sad blue, it could be happy blue, it could be peaceful blue, but my mood at the moment when I'm about to work on that poem wants Will, will tell me where I want to go. So it's an odd process, but I do do lots of revisions, and I love to revise. Um, so 30, 40 revisions is not unusual. At this stage, uh, I do most of my revisions by myself until I reach a point where I either need to give it lots of time, because time is a great reviser too, you know, <laughs> just uh, months of, of uh, putting it aside. Or I will show it, a lot of times I'll show it to my, my husband, who is a novelist. And as a prose writer, he has a totally different take on things. So he comes at it a different way. Um, I yearn for those old days, you know, from graduate school where you go into a workshop and people would give you all these ideas and you take it away from them. But at this point, um, that does, doesn't, it's not in the card, so. I think it's both. I think that that you certainly don't have to be aged and you know and and travel the world to write a poem. In fact, sometimes traveling the world is is, is a way of not writing a poem. But uh, it's the quality of experience. It's being able to to experience something, and when you begin to write about it, be able to apply the tools that you need for writing you know, a mastery of the language and a way of, 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 of piecing together the language, I guess, uh, that those two factors have to come together. So you do need to, be, to work at it, but you also have to be able to know when to, when to 
take the experience as it happened, when to tweak it a little bit, what part of the experience is going to move somebody else and what part is really your own um, private moment. So I've, I've seen poems written by very young people which are absolutely stunning and of course we have examples of Baudelaire and you know wrote when he was in his teens these are amazing poems so he obviously didn't have a wealth of experience or age or anything like that and I've seen poems which of course could only have been written by someone who was older and had lived certain you know stages of life have gone through certain stages of life but it's a combination of the two it really is I, I've always felt that that the poems I've written, which have historical context, um, are hopefully not just simply plucking something out of history and saying, ooh, great, let's write about that. In, in every case, what has happened is that I've become fascinated or haunted by something and couldn't shake it. As an African American, as a woman, I think that I've been sensitized to the way in which history uh, privileges the white male <laughs> and the way in which certain aspects of history, the things that we are taught in school, the things that are handed down, never, never enter the picture, though they might have been very important. Anyone can tell you that, uh, at the risk of oversimplification, let me say that anyone can tell you that, that, that how you're raised as a child has a great deal to do with how you behave as an adult. And uh, whether you have complexes or whether you need to prove yourself or all that kind of stuff. And yet, the mother in a traditional family who has raised a child never makes it in the history books. I mean, and yet. So, so those kinds of things have always irritated me, let's put it that way. And, um, and I'm always reminded when I when I see someone, you know, Napoleon stalks through the battlefields and I think, yeah, but how did he get that way? You know, how did this guy become who he was? So that's that's the predisposition I had, I think, as as a writer, as as a person um, who wanted to create poetry. Uh, it's one of the things that has always been one of my um, the things I carry along with me. Each time it's different. For instance, in this new book, which is uh, tells the story of a of a black, a mixed race violinist, George Bridgetower, who grew up in 18th and 19th century Europe. I came upon him because I was watching a movie, Immortal Beloved, and there was a scene in which Beethoven walks by a group of musicians, and there's this black violinist. I'm like, what? I, I've heard of Colin Black casting, but this is a bit strange. And so I looked him up. And the, I didn't intend to write poems I, about it. Um, I just wanted to know more about him. And I kept reading, and the more I read, the more I realized the only way I was going to get him out of my head was to get into his <laughs> and start writing about him. So in each case, it's, it's been something like that. Um,